Hello, and welcome to today's webcast. My name is Dennis Semeca, Associate Editor at Vision Systems Design. The speakers for today's webcast, Leveraging Deep Learning and AI Applications in Manufacturing, are Peter Dara, VP of Product Development, and Stephen Welch, VP of Data Science from Mariner. Before we begin, a few words about this webcast platform. This platform allows our audience to customize their webcast console to suit their own preferences. You can move windows around by dragging on the Windows title bar or resize your windows by clicking on the lower right corner of any window. You will also find a toolbar at the bottom of your console labeled with different windows you can open. Click on the icons to open or close those tools on your screen. If you should experience difficulties with the audio or the advancing of the presentation slides, simply press your F5 key to refresh your webcast console. There's also a help tool, a yellow box with a question mark, in the bottom toolbar. Please click on this icon if you need additional assistance with a technical issue. We encourage you to ask questions using the Q&A icon on the bottom toolbar. You may post your questions at any point during the webcast, and we will address as many of those questions as possible before the end of the webcast. For your convenience, this presentation will be available on demand within 24 hours of this live event. A reminder email message will be sent to all registrants with a link to the archive. It will also be accessible from our homepage. Before we begin, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Marina. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Peter Dara and Stephen Welch. Good morning. Uh, my name is Peter Dara, and with me is Stephen Welch. Um, thank you very much for the intro, Dennis. And uh, I think we'll just get going. Um, so why is a Microsoft AI OT partner talking about visual inspection? Well, Mariner has won Microsoft's Worldwide IoT Partner of the Year Award this year. Uh, Microsoft, they never explained the judging process, but we think the major reason we won was because we pressed with our visual inspection solution. Now, some might say IoT isn't vision, but AI merchants like me, we see visual inspection as another AI IoT workload. And I'll hope you'll be interested in why a company who never selected or installed a camera system who never selected or installed lighting, who never had to resolve an image formation challenge, is succeeding in the visual inspection space. And if you're interested in why AI people are interested in industrial villages inspection and how AI people approach visual inspection problems, what customers value when AI IoT people do visual inspection, then I hope you'll find this section informative. So number one, why is an AI IoT company with no prior investment in computer vision interested in visual inspection. Well, did I mention our visual inspection customers, they do not buy the system. They subscribe to it with multi-year agreements. And this offers numerous advantages for an AI company and some challenges too. Even for an IRT specialist, Spyglass Visual Inspection, our product relies on Microsoft Azure, which everybody rents from Microsoft. And Microsoft invest and incent through their partner ecosystem, anything related to Azure AI IoT consumption. And they're acutely interested in helping anything that's edge related. So visual inspection at the edge using Azure services with multi-year revenue streams is probably why Microsoft like visual inspection. And I know we do. A computer vision edge device it's just another IoT workload with a significant AI component in it and a center of expertise for an AI IoT company. And the reason AI companies like visual inspection too. So number two, how AI IoT people, how do they approach these visual inspection problems? Well, if um, AI companies like Mariner really are interested in operational technologies, factory floor technology. And that isn't crossing over the carpet to do IT business, but AI companies are very experienced in classic AI IT, and their AI experiences are motivated by I4.0. They're interested in operational technology business and they're learning how to operate on the concrete. They're learning how to operate on a factory floor. But do they have what it takes? Well, let, let's compare them, okay? So, 
Successful machine vision companies, in, in my opinion, from the ones that I've worked with, they share common characteristics developed from decades of experience on a flight floor. They know how to perfect images. They know how to communicate with control systems. And they've mastered a rich arsenal of specialized tooling. They're application-centric. They're not data-centric. But Stephen, how do these stack up compared to the people on the AI bandwagon? Yeah, th thank you, Peter. Um, and yet what we're trying to really set up here, I think, just as Peter indicated, is, you know, we're, we're kind of trying to lay out for you kind of how we see the landscape right now. And then we'll get into some specific use cases and things like that. Um, but right now, you know, it's kind of a noisy time for deep learning. You know, every, you know, I, I subscribe to Vision System Design Magazine and every time there's an article on deep learning, which is very interesting. Um, and you see it everywhere, you know. Um, and we look out there and we see who's doing deep learning. And we talk to a lot of folks who either want to do deep learning or are doing deep learning. Um, and some of them become our customers. Um, but right now, yeah, just like like Peter mentioned, you know, there's really two camps in our in our kind of survey of, of what's out there. Just like Peter mentioned, there's traditional machine vision uh, providers, and they really have you know the image formation part, you know, well, well, uh, well, performing well. And the reason for that is they kind of have to because um, traditional machine vision algorithms can be a bit sensitive. So you have to have you know that that's the area where you really have to lock things down. And we'll talk about that in a little more detail. Um, but then you also see all these other vendors coming out there with AI solutions. Um, and, you know, we thought about how we wanted to kind of make this argument here. I mean, we're, we're keeping it a little bit general, but you can probably imagine some of the companies that would, that would belong in that bubble to the right. Um, and we're calling it the bandwagon here. And there's plenty of companies in this, in this space doing great work. But it, but it is, you know, this is a, if you look at the Gardner hype cycle, you know, deep learning is way at the top. Um, and there, there is noise right now. Um, and there is a tendency for some of these companies to think that, you know, kind of one size fits all. Um, and that's just not true in manufacturing. And I hope that comes through in this presentation. Um, but the, the companies out there offering general AI solutions, generally they're very, very good at kind of cloud-centric, enterprise-scale, um, global solutions. And I think for folks in traditional machine vision, you may think, oh, you know, I don't need that, right? You know, that's not what I, I need. A, I need a machine vision system on this production line. Um, but I think hopefully what, what uh, a takeaway from this presentation is that we see that there really is a gap in the middle where traditional machine visions do need some of that global enterprise scale. You can really, you know, get great performance gains if you kind of zoom out and think about the bigger picture and, and start to think about your vision system as just another node in your overall IoT network, right? If you think about it that way, um, there's just so much amazing stuff you can do with the data. Um, and that can really drive a bunch of very interesting business cases that, that drive more value than just simple pass fail on parts, for example. So um, what we're really kind of getting at here is we believe there's a gap in the middle. And through this deck, we're going to talk through, you know, uh, what do we think belongs in the middle? And I think, you know, uh, we're going to claim that our solution is, is in the middle, of course. But I think we're trying to make a bigger argument here about, you know, we're going to share some of our, our case studies and, and experience and hopefully show uh, w what we believe it takes to really succeed in, in deep learning and manufacturing. And as I said, we'll do that through some, some stories and through some, some case studies. Um, so with that said, I'll hop into some more, more details here. And I want to spend just, just a minute kind of talking about some deep learning, um, just to set a little bit of context here. Um, and we did another VSD webinar back in March. And if you're interested in kind of a technical deep dive more on the algorithm deep learning side, I encourage you to check that out. We'll spend just a little bit of time on the algorithm aspect of deep learning here, kind of, you know, what, why should we care about deep learning? Um, and then also, if you want to kind of nerd out and ask more technical questions, please schedule a call with us. We'll have our emails at the end of the, end of the deck. Um, we'd love to nerd out and share more technical details. Uh, but I'll just give you a quick, you know, four-minute intro, why, why, why care about deep learning? Um, and my favorite way to do this is to share an example that one of our customers has, has let us use. Um, this is from fabric manufacturing, and we'll share a full case study of this at the end of this presentation. Um, but I just want to use their, their data to kind of give you a flavor for what's going on. And many audience members may be aware of, of what the power of deep learning is, but I think it's helpful just to kind of level set for a minute just to make sure we're on the same page. Um, so the way I like to introduce this is, you know, pretend you woke up tomorrow morning and you were a head of quality for a global fabric manufacturer, and you're deciding which products to ship to your customers, right? And I'm obviously way oversimplifying, but th these images came from a vision system. And let's say you had to decide which of those four to ship. Um, so take a second, you know, using your, your human eyeballs and your, your skills here and, and see what you think, you know, which of those show um, defects. So I'll give you just one minute to think about it. Which of those four, and it could be more than one, you know, which of those four show defective little samples of, of fabric? And just a little more context, these are taken from a machine vision system that takes uh, high-speed pictures as a roll of fabric goes beneath it. So these are kind of like two-by-two-inch square pictures of, of a larger roll. Okay, so I will go ahead and show the answer here. 
Um, so it turns out that this is the answer. So the, the one on the far left, that is a good piece of fabric. That should go to the customer, no problem. The one on the right, you know, that has a big hole in it. Let's not ship that, right? Uh, those two center ones, though, that's where it gets really interesting, and that's kind of where the rub is. Um, so to a trained fabric, you know, quality person, expert, um, they know that the, the second one is actually a stain. So that is a stain that seeped into the fabric, and we cannot ship that to our customers, and it's not coming out. Um, the third one, though, is actually just a piece of a flock or kind of residue on the fabric. Um, you can imagine that, that, of course, in manufacturing, you try to keep debris and stuff like that off of your, your products, but it can be very difficult in practice. Um, and it's one of the biggest issues we see with traditional machine vision systems is, is, is having trouble rejecting dirty parts like this, of whatever your source of dirt is. So um, we'll get into that in more detail now, but it's just it, what we want to draw with this example is, hey, there's two similar looking things. You know, How are we going to differentiate those with a machine vision system? Okay. So just a little bit more background here. So you know, machine vision's been around for a long time. Um, and I think hopefully part of what, what you get out of this presentation is, is our, our thinking on how deep learning fits into traditional machine vision. We don't think it's just simple as just replacing, right? It's a lot more complicated. There's a lot of nuance. Um, in traditional machine vision, um, usually you, you follow this two-step pipeline. And I'll just summarize it real briefly here. And as I said, we have a webinar back in March that goes into more depth here. Um, but in traditional machine vision, you're really you're looking for what are called features. Um, so you take your image, that's like raw pixel numbers, and you, you do some math on those numbers, um, and you compute what are called features. Um, so two features you may compute in this example. You may compute, let's say, the contrast. Uh, the contrast is the difference between the darkest and the lightest pixel in a region. Um, and you may also compute like defect size. You might try to estimate you know, how big is this defect. So th that's the idea. And what you end up with then is you do some kind of decisioning. So you say, okay, if my image has a defect that's bigger than 10 millimeters and you know, the contrast is greater than you know, uh, a 20 or something, uh, then it must be a defect, right? So you do decisioning based on that. Um, what happens then in practice is you can run into some, to some challenges. So um, in many applications, this works just fine. Um, but in here's, here's the same pipeline shown again. And on the, on the left, we have traditional machine vision. Um, but in some cases, it can be very difficult to tune those parameters of a traditional machine vision system to adequately you know, do what you need to do. Um, and I bring that up, and I'll just go back to the slide just briefly. So you know, imagine you were trying to solve this problem with traditional machine vision. Um, the two center images, right? they have very similar contrasts. You have very, very similar differences between dark and light. And you have very similar sizes. right? So you're going to have to get very creative with your features to be able to resolve this. Um, and that can be a real challenge, and it can be, you know, you may be able to solve it once, but generally you're going to create a more complex pipeline that may be brittle or may be susceptible to different kinds of issues that could creep in over time. So by creating a more complicated rules-based system to address this issue, you, you introduce some brittleness to your process that are, it could make your system harder to maintain over time, and we, we see that all the time. Um, so just as a summary then, you know, so what we do at Spyglass at Mariner, um, with Spyglass at Mariner and, and other companies are doing now too, of course, um, is replacing that two-step process with a deep learning model. We'll talk about why we would do that in just a minute, but um, the thing to know, and I think this is really core to this conversation, is that when you switch to deep learning, instead of designing a pipeline by hand, you are learning the pipeline. So the, the, the algorithm actually is learned from data, so it's, in, it's empirical. Um, that's the one, if you're only going to know one thing about deep learning, I'd say know that, right? So the, the model is going to be learned from labeled data, and we'll get into that in more detail. Um, and just the last thing I'll say, just as a kind of an intro to deep learning here, is that, you know, why would you do this? And this is my favorite slide to show here. And if you're, if you're kind of looking to see how the industry is changing and what trends there are out there, this is, I think, one of the best trends to point to in, in computer vision, I, I believe. So this is this is performance on what was kind of the most challenging open source uh, computer vision data set out there. It's called the ImageNet data set. Um, it has around a million images in it. And back in 2011, uh, you know, nine years ago, the, 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 the best state-of-the-art models, they used that two-step process, so feature extraction decisioning. Um, and if you gave those algorithms five guesses on this data set, um, the very best algorithm in the world in 2011 had an error rate of 26%. Um, so it got it wrong one out of four times, uh, which is not, you know, that's not production grade. We can't deploy that into manufacturing. So no one was doing deep learning. Um, well, there's some small cases, but almost no one was doing deep learning back in, let's say, 2011 in manufacturing. In 2012, this really important paper came out from the University of Toronto, where um, the authors used uh, GPUs from NVIDIA, and they, uh, they trained a, a unified deep learning model, end-to-end uh, -end is what they kind of called it. Um, and they improved performance by 40%. Uh, 
Um, and what's really exciting is in the following years, performance improved and improved and improved until 2015 when, when researchers at Microsoft published a paper called ResNet, um, where for the first time they beat human performance on this data set. Um, so the technology is out there. Like this is real technology. It's not vaporware. It's really there. It doesn't mean it's easy, but it, but it's there, right? So um, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Peter. Um, I'm just going to leave it on a high note. I'll say, hey, look, this technology is out there. You know what could go wrong, <laughs> right? So I, I will hand it back over to Peter. Well, uh, thank you, Stephen. Well, I'll fix that. Well, let's understand that success. It comes from experience. So how much experience do AI and IoT? deep learning people really have on factory floor problems. I mean, visual inspection ex accepted. If you look around for a few hours around the internet, you don't find really any of it until this year. And you search Industry Week archives like I did, and there's nothing really until this year either. So is that because AI and deep learning are too new? Well, if you remember this slide, all right, then <laughs> 2015 is probably the earliest you can get. 2014 is probably the earliest you can ever find deep learning on the factory floor. Well, that's a while ago. And the cloud was born in 2010. So it's even older than deep learning. So that can't explain this six year gap from theory to practice. So what is it about the factory floor that's so problematic for AI? I mean, is it the environment? Is it the AI people? Or is it the engineers they're working with? Well, if they are people are getting it done on the flat roof, they're not getting it done, then what's holding them back? So this is exhibit A in my mind. In looking for the earliest examples, I've noticed a recurring theme where AI people failed in manufacturing situations. And this example here, this isn't even addressing the harsh conditions of the factory floor. Even in the back office world of scheduling, AI projects were problematic. And the prior study, that was from 1990, but we're still struggling with AI in manufacturing today. This quote, this quote's from Jay Lee's book, Industrial AI. Terry Gap, the, the leader at Foxconn at the time, when he was addressing AI people in Stanford in 2018, he was concerned, oh, they're, they're, they were only interested in his data. They weren't really interested in his problems. So maybe it's the AI people, okay, that, that are the issue here. Here's another example. World-class manufacturer reviewing the best-in-class IoT offerings. This is from um, August 2020, Industry Week interview. Uh, Roger and Jeffrey Leiker, you know, the, uh, the guy famous for his book, Toyota Way. They were discussing I4.0. And Roger's observation is, if you fail to solve a real problem, you will get what he calls IoT wallpaper. Now, this is a this is a comment about IoT people, it's not AI people, but there's obvious similarities in the sense that they come from this IT background. Okay, so perhaps the subtle AI and deep learning on the factory floor right now, not because of the technology's shortcomings, but because the AI people's lack of interest in solving all the non-AI problems essential to delivering real value. And I think that really speaks to the question mark in the middle that we saw earlier in the slide. If this attitude is a limiting behavior responsible for a lack of factory floor AI, then how do you, how do you change that dynamic? Okay. Well, the solution, according to uh, Roger Schimbacher, is work together on real problems at the actual place. And Roger is referring to IoT, not specifically AI, but I suggest the solution may be the same. AI and domain experts solving real problems together. In my mind, that's clue number one. Visual inspection is a real problem at a real place. And Jay Lee's advice on recognizing a real problem is to solve a problem that's not been solved in the past. AI people like looking for future problems. They like going back to previously solved problems. The plant leaderships and engineers Stephen and I have talked to, they're far more receptive to solving a previously unsolved problem. And that's clue number two. Deep learning has a real opportunity to solve a previously unsolved visual inspection problems. This is why visual inspection is really appealing to AI IoT companies. It ticks all the boxes. They have something new to offer to an old problem. It's a real problem at the real place, and the people who train the model are the people who benefit the most from it. And it's, so it's a very powerful reason to work together. Purposeful innovation was described by Dr. Jeffrey Leiker, the Toyota uh, Way guy, uh, in a conference in Dallas in 2016 as a method to create a culture of learning, allowing you to consistently solve large problems. Production deployments 
and deep learning fits perfectly into this continuous improvement mindset, where alternate models and refinements are identical to the PDA cycle of experiments he suggests. And this recurring theme of, of collaboration and continuation will make more sense a little bit later. So Jeffrey Leiker's book also refers to uh, an acid test, an acid test of proving value. Now, a visual inspection workload is ideal for AI companies wanting to avoid delivering IoT wallpaper and getting stuck in zombie POC situations. Because once the labeled image is available, you can prove the value of a preliminary deep model, a deep learning model in hours. Whereas if you compare that to the other IoT projects that normally happen, they take weeks and months to actually prove out their value. So um, we mentioned in the abstract the, about a chemical company. Well, the chemical company has got really nothing to do with visual inspection, but in my mind, it's got everything to do with why customers engage with AI, IoT companies, which is one of the points I was making earlier. Those companies value a relationship based on continuous improvement through continuous engagement. They're not interested in a once and done point in time install, you know, call me if you've got any problems kind of attitude. They really are interested in, they're there forever. They're, they're interested in stacking small wins over time. And the advantage of that is it guarantees you, honestly, you remain relevant through all the way through to the next subscription renewal. And because it's a subscription model, we're very invested in the fact that it's continuously accepted and proven value. AI people, deep learning people, they love the cloud. And we've referred to it repeatedly. And, and the reason is the cloud is ideal for deep learning because you can scale your compute and storage with a push of a button, right? Enables an enterprise-wide mindset that Stephen was talking about earlier that encourages innovation. Because, because once those deep learning investments are made, that pipeline to effortlessly to kind of deploy them out and distribute multiple versions to multiple sites across the world with a cloud attitude, it, it's obvious. And those same cloud features that can deliver that can deliver constant monitoring of model performance and a means of collaborating on their improvement. There's a place to go, there's a place to meet. And this is why the cloud is so important to these AI companies. It's a default resource for enterprise scale model management. And also it's a major component of our visual inspection product, Spyglass visual inspection. And remember, when we, when we use Azure, we get more attention and more money from Microsoft, right? Mm -hmm. AI and deep learning learn from inference, where, it, where behavior is represented by data. You can't train a model without data. So it really wasn't in, entirely unfair for those people to say, well, why are you always asking about my data? But the data is what really drives. The cloud allows you to precision and maintain it with very little IT expertise. And so it's a lot easier than sometimes working through with corporate IT. But the cloud, it's not ideal for all situations. Look, none of these four that I'm listing out here, they're not, they're, they're not specific to AI or they're even visual inspection, but you can't ignore them. Okay, the first two, they're just policy barriers, but the second two are technical barriers and they are addressable. Lost connectivity, separation anxiety, as I call it, it's a thing. To calculate your lost connectivity, you really should run the simulation. I've never seen anyone do it, All right? This is dumb, <laughs> probably because they can't agree with the probability profiles. They're just, they're just not there. <laughs> but if you can't calculate your risk with a simulation, then just consider these examples, you know, matching inference slash decision to your connectivity risk. Now, for some situations, hours and minutes, no connectivity, unimportant. But what do you do when you're separated from your model, right? When it does happen, why not learn how to deal with communication failure from our own air traffic system, the FAA? Firstly, their advisors agree in advance what to do when it happens, so each side will know what to expect. And designing in these procedures as we have into our IoT and AI, our edge designs, these work well, but they only work well for the non-inference side of a visual inspection solution. They're really good for distributing new models, software updates, monitoring, track side, labeling even, but it doesn't help with inference because you, you can't decide in advance if a part is good or bad, right? So you're <laughs> going to need a different plan. And I'm going to let Stephen explain what that different plan is. Great. Thank you, Peter. 
Yeah. So as Peter mentioned, you know, there, there's a lot to like about the cloud. You know, it's not just a passing trend, right? And and I think, you know, it might be easy as a manufacturer to say, oh, you know, the cloud's not for us. And, and when we say cloud, you know, we're not just talking about public cloud, for example, too. You know, what we're really talking about is distributing your systems, right? Um, I'd say that that's the, the core thing that we're really, you know, for us, usually it is public cloud, but there are other ways to do these things. Um, but yeah, just like Peter said, you know, the, the biggest complaint, and we get this question almost every time, you know, when as soon as they see that we have some kind of cloud component, the question is always, well, what's going to happen when the internet goes down, right? Because it, it happens, right? So, um, so what are we going to do about that, right? So we'll walk you through a case study um, of how we address that. And I think, you know, part of the answer is fairly obvious, but parts of it are a little bit more subtle. So, um, so I think this case study will hopefully uh, underline, you know, how we handle that situation at Mariner and why we think um, this way of handling it's important and how it kind of fits into the, the whole landscape like we like we introduced at the beginning of the of the talk. Um, so this is, this is a glass manufacturer. This is one of our customers. Um, and, and glass manufacturing is interesting um, because you have, you know, a pretty fast clip of very high resolution images. So here, you know, they're using a, um, it's essentially a line scan camera. Um, and this collects, you know, every every few seconds. You can think of uh, an image on the order of 100 megapixels. So think, you know, 10,000 by 10,000 pixels. So really high resolution. Um, and they need to make a decision on that piece of glass, you know, within just a few seconds. So very, very, very uh, high processing requirements. Um, and, and for this customer, they had an existing vision system. It works very well for image capture. Um, like many systems we see, kind of like we addressed at the beginning of the, of the talk, um, these systems can struggle with high false rejects. So if the glass gets wet and if the glass gets dirty, um, those look a lot like defects, right? So it's very, it was very difficult for this customer to, to tease apart those different categories. And for a number of process reasons, it was impossible for them to have totally clean glass. Um, so they needed a different approach because they were throwing away significantly more glass than they, than they should have been. Um, so that's where we came in. Um, and we'll kind of underline this at the end, but but another kind of a piece of the puzzle here, and I, I hope the overall context makes sense. They we're, re we're really trying to communicate, you know, what have we learned from, from doing this, you know, quite a few times? Um, what have we learned to make these projects successful? And it's not just the tech, it's not just the deep learning, right? There's a bunch of stuff that goes around it and a bunch of things uh, to think about as you're as you're working through your project and all your different stakeholders um, there's there's a lot of pieces to it so but I'll, I'll mention the deep learning piece of this project just briefly so we started this and we usually do try to start these projects just by showing you know what the technology can do um, so we usually do that by by having a, a, an image sample taken um, so here we started with you know let's this is around 130 uh, image examples um, and this is kind of a proof of concept that we would generally do. And th these results have been changed just a little bit, but the overall performance is, is very similar to, to the, how this POC was done in, in production. Um, so on the left, you have the confusion matrix of the current vision system. And there really were just three classes they were looking at at the time. Uh, we've expanded since then. But at the time, it was you know a piece of glass with either defective, it was good, or it had water on it. And water, of course, is it's not a defect, but it can appear to be a defect. Um, the current vision system for this on this data set, it really struggled here. Um, the water looks a lot like a defect, um, and it, it, that led to a false positive rate of around 25%. You can see those 30 examples in the bottom left corner. Um, so those are on the, the water row. For that, the, that row corresponds to images that the, the experts, that our customers have labeled as, as just wet. Um, and the column corresponds to the prediction from our model, and the model is saying defective. Um, and I shouldn't say our model there. I'm sorry, the existing vision system. Um, so in, for those 30 examples, the existing vision system threw those away, right? So those are false rejects. So when we did this POC, we actually, the first time through, we actually got kind of bad results. Like we had like, you know, maybe 80% accuracy, like an improvement, but not dramatic. And we were trying to figure it out and I was kind of missed for a little while. Um, and then we noticed that our model was picking up on a certain kind of, maybe our model thought it had found a defect, but our customer hadn't indicated that it was a defect. Um, and we went back to our customer and said, hey, you know, what is this? What's happening on this, this spot on the product? And they said, oh, yeah, we forgot to tell you. That's a defect. Um, so it was, it was interesting. It's nice when, when that does happen. Um, so here we, we added a new defect class. Um, and by doing that, we were able to uh, achieve on, the, on this POC over 95% accuracy and drop that false positive rate to less than 1%. Um, so in the right context, you really can get dramatically better performance with deep learning. I hope this is kind of what that underlines. Um, and there are considerations around it, and it is a different kind of approach and a different kind of system. But um, for the right kind of problem, you really can drive uh, significant improvements. And the last thing I'll say is so 
you know, that was the POC, you know, how do we actually get this thing into production, right? Um, and what we're kind of showing you here is like a cloud light implementation. So, so for this customer, you know, and especially early on, um, most, uh, not most, but maybe 60 to 70% of the folks we talk to, um, they just want kind of a better mousetrap. They're saying, hey, my vision system, you know, it's really good at images, but uh, it struggles with this, it struggles with that. Can we, you know, what can we do? Um, and, and, and usually the focus at first is just on let's improve that performance. Um, so for this customer, the way we've solved this problem is we've we've deployed an edge computing solution. This is this is a very common pattern for us. So we have a, a high compute, uh, high power compute uh, computer deployed on each production line that grabs images from the current uh, scanning system. Um, there is an HMI built into that system that allows operators to change recipes, and you can visualize the model outputs. You can change the deep learning model, things like that, and you can actually tag. So we have some labeling functionality built into that app as well. Um, so that gets deployed on premise. Um, and then we do use cloud for data collection and updates. And actually, at this customer now, we do use cloud for retraining. And we'll get into how that works more in a, in a later case study. Um, but the big point we want to make is that you know all inferencing, all decisioning, that happens on the edge. Um, so the cloud is there for what it's good for, right? And that's for model retraining, kind of the slow, non-mission critical stuff. Um, but all the decision happens on the edge. Um, and if the internet goes down, you are still alive making decisions for you know indefinitely, really. Um, so that we find that architecture to be to be really important, and what we want to do in this next section, and I'll hand it back over to Peter in one minute. I just have one more slide, um, is we want to kind of expand on this. So you know, and this this is a very common path we find with customers, right? They at first they want a better mousetrap, and then once they realize that the cloud can can do more, um, and not just the cloud, you know, having centralized data, um, then we can really expand on that. So that's what we'll get into next. Um, but just one other comment, um, as far as the edge compute capability, you know, we are partners with, uh, with Intel, for example, um, and there's just there's a million options here. So there is some complexity and things to think through as you're thinking through your, your edge compute capability. Um, but there's a, uh, there's a ton of accelerators coming onto the market. Um, traditionally, you know, the, uh, this was a, a very expensive area to be in to be able to do that level of compute on the factory floor. Um, and it still is, and some, for some applications, it can be more expensive than, than other types of solutions, especially um, more traditional PCs. Um, but it's, it's dramatically becoming cheaper, and there's just a million different options. Hardware vendors, NVIDIA, Intel, um, they're, they're investing a lot of money um, in developing these solutions, and we, we partner with these, these companies quite often, and they've, they've been very you know, great partners to us in these, in these endeavors. Um, and there's just so many compute options. Again, if you're interested, we'd love to talk your ear, about it, uh, ear off about it. Um, just just reach out to us after the webinar. Um, so with that, I will hand it off to Peter, and we've I've kind of shown, I hope, kind of how you can be successful deploying on the edge. And now we're going to kind of expand from there and talk about other capabilities we can do using that AI IoT kind of background. Thanks, Stephen. Okay, so you you you've seen how AI run in the cloud. I mean, it's the preferred option for AI IoT work in general, but it isn't appropriate for visual instruments. This topology here, not going to work. Okay. Now, what you saw earlier is a more abstracted version of uh, visual inspection. It must have its AI running at the edge, but the cloud is still an important component, as, uh, as Stephen mentioned, for retraining, model management, it's perfect to maintain situational awareness of how well your models are performing. And that's very important if you're in a subscription service because you want to make sure it's still delivering values. And of course, being an AI IoT company, we naturally include connected product features because they both, and they do it because, you know, we do it because we both know how to do it. And, and, they've, and it also values situational awareness. It brings to support teams and customer success teams responsible for renewals. They know how, the, how things are going, they're aware of it. And this is how a, AI, IoT companies like Mariner, this is how we deploy deep learning visual inspection solution. And, and it's also why it fits, it fits our goals, it fits our strategic goals, it's aligned with our core expertise. Um, and that's because, as Stephen said, it, a visual inspection device is just another node at the end of the network, as far as we're concerned. So, we've explained why companies like Mariner are interested in doing visual inspection and, and, and how they like to de deploy their solutions. And, and we've explained a little of our, uh, the preferred go-to-market strategies. And now we're going to explain what the customers value when asking people like us, AI people, to do visual inspection. And the first clue is in the topography shown here. Look at the objects on the left there. 
look at all those machines. Right? So visual inspection can improve the productivity of inspectors, graders, and, and QA people. And it can also improve the efficiency of the overall plant if it prevents more value being added to defective items. That's why the glass people wanted it. They didn't want to put another X hundred dollars worth of value on something that was already broken. But it can never in isolation improve upstream yield, right? IoT companies, we're always aligning ourselves with an I-4-0 vision. You know, where cyber physical systems make the right decisions at short notice. Spyglass Connected Factory is, a, is an I-4-0 product from Marina. It's a smart portion of the smart factory. And what could be smarter than using the results of visual inspection to improve upstream yield? Which is why customers value IoT companies delivering visual inspection because their solutions both demand have a frontline capability to prevent defects as they're trending. A connected factory captures a rich data set of how your production line was running. You can see the set points and the recipes used. The AI models can identify complex interactions and subtle shifts. Now, if you combine that, when you can see who and where and when those defects were made, you can provide an interesting closed loop feedback system where both your AI and your visual inspection, it all works together to improve the performance of the entire operation. And if you want to see what one of those looks like in practice, I'll hand it over to Stephen for our final case study. Great, thank you, Peter. That Stephen. was a, that was an awesome. Thank you. Um, that was an awesome setup. I don't. I barely have to say anything. That was perfect. <laughs> so, um, the well, what I'll do now is we'll just underline what Peter has pointed out um, through a specific example. Um, and yeah, just like Peter mentioned, and I, I hope this this is coming through as kind of the overall thread we're trying to establish here. You know, once you once you kind of go into production and you show that that you can deploy these deep learning models, they can make the right decisions. They can help you know, um, let's say, reduce false rejects. Um, that's just the beginning, right? <clears throat> There's so much more you can do, um, and uh, it just depends on who we're talking to. Some folks are kind of already thinking that way. They're like, okay, you know, I've got this better decisioning mechanism, but really, that that's kind of like a data source. It's like a real time data source that you can use to do all kinds of upstream improvements. So um, we'll walk that through that now with uh, with this use case. So this ties back to the beginning of the hour. You know, I showed you these four images um, in the upper uh, center of the screen. Um, and now we'll just give a little more context and walk through this case study. Um, so this comes again from a, a very high quality uh, machine vision system. Um, there's a picture of it on the upper left hand corner there. Um, this system, it's pretty cool. So you know you can send a, a roll of fabric through this machine. That's a huge box right there. It's like 12 feet high, 12 feet wide. Um, you send a roll of fabric through it um, and it produces a defect map. So that, that scatter plot you see on the bottom, that is the, the defect map for that roll of fabric. Um, so the vertical axis, that's the width of the fabric. It's about uh, 10 feet wide. The units are in inches. Um, and the uh, the horizontal axis is the length of the fabric. So that's about uh, 900 yards, half a mile of fabric, something like that. Um, and every point on that defect map, that's where the current system you know, believed there to be a defect. So that was kind of the starting point. Um, and our, uh, this customer came to us, and, and they knew that the, the system had great imaging capabilities, but they also knew that a lot of those points in practice were not actually defects. Um, and this and that's very common. It happens all the time in machine, in machine vision. Um, there's something going on there, but it may not be a true defect. Um, and this defect map is, is critical. This is used and in, in, it's passed along the quality, you know, as, as the kind of quality artifact through the manufacturing process. And eventually, a, a version of this map is used to actually cut out bad fabric from a roll, for example. So, so it has a huge implication on yields. Um, it's a, a very, very important thing to get right. Um, so that was kind of our starting point. Um, so for this customer, um, you'll notice um, that. Uh, here, I'll go ahead and show you their POC results or, or a, a version of their PLC, POC results at the beginning of their project. Um, and for them, they, they were interested in, in more fine grain detections. Um, and in the glass example, we actually have expanded since the results we've shown you to more, more categories. Um, but for this customer, the automotive, uh, the automotive fabric example, um, they have up to you know, 20 categories now, something like that. Um, in the POC, you know, they were interested in three different non-defect categories, so things that look like defects that aren't, um, and then six different defect categories. Um, so we took those in, we collaborated to label a data set, we trained a model. Um, this is the initial model result. We achieved around 98% accuracy. Um, and there's a little iteration, as you can imagine, in these initial, initial conversations and labeling efforts. 
Um, but where, where it really you know, started to become a viable option is when we took that number and we compared it to a couple meaningful benchmarks for this customer. Um, you know, you come back with these accuracies and like, is 97 points, is that good? You know, it's hard to know, right? So it, it very much depends on, on the industry and the application. Um, here we compared it to two things. We compared it to manual inspection, so graders, you know, watching the fabric move by. And we compared it to, um, to the current vision system that, that, you know, excellent image capability, but did have a, a pretty high false reject rate um, for certain types of fabric. Um, so we were able to reduce that false, false reject rate by around 30x. So it's not 30%, right? It's 30 times less false positives. Um, and then also compared to human inspectors, we were around two to five times better. Um, you may ask yourself, you know, hey, this, this data was labeled by humans, right? And then it was used to train our model. So how can we beat humans? Um, the real reason is that the labeled training set, that's kind of your best expert on their best day. So they can sit down, they can label, take their time, right? Um, whereas, you know, grading on the production line is a totally different task. You, you know, you have eight hour shifts, sometimes 12 hour shifts. It's a very, very hard job, right? So, um, so in that context, you really can outperform a human inspection in, in a lot of these cases. Okay, so as far as our results, I just want to share one more thing. So the um, the upper defect map that is um, that's before. So that's the the defect map we get out of the existing system. Um, the map on the bottom is the cleaned defect map. So that's the been processed by our algorithm. We're able to make more granular classifications, as we mentioned. Um, these defects, of course, have names. We've changed them just you know to protect our customers' information. Um, but the bottom plot, you know, that, those are with 98% accuracy, the real defects. So if you are cutting defective fabric out of a roll, um, you can imagine that this makes a huge difference to have a more accurate defect map. So um, we're able to remove those false positives really, really effectively um, in this application. And then to tie this back, you know, to really pick up back on Peter's thread. So I hope that that makes sense on the deep learning side. Now let's talk about the overall production, IT, deployment, maintenance kind of side. Um, so what are we doing here, right? So once again, we need inference on the edge for this customer. They need they need that that fabric roll to be processed quickly. Um, we have to process on the edge. Um, so we still we use an edge compute component just like we did before. Um, but here, and this is an area we're really excited about. We have we've done more, right? And, and this is I think where opportunities really start to open up. Um, so the, the cloud is used for data collection for retraining, um, but it's also used as Peter mentioned for upstream quality monitoring. Something we're not showing on this slide that we should add is we're actually we're bringing in other data from the customer. So you know we, we have that quality analytics tile there, and we have monitoring and alerting, um, and both of those are implemented and running at this customer. But I don't think it fully gets across um, what we how we have done this here. Um, so and I'll show a screenshot in a second of, of one of the, the views that they use for their analytics. Um, but what we do, just to give you an example, um, is let's say that you know fabrics in production and there's a spike in a certain kind of defect. Um, we pull in the, uh, the the data from their their MES basically, you know, their manufacturing executional system. We blend that together, right? And now we know that hey, you know, this roll that was made on knitting machine number seven in factory X, um, it has a significantly more of this kind of defect, right? Um, so before, you know, some of these processes detecting that that specific knitting machine is making certain errors, um, that could take in the past. It could have taken months to figure that out. Um, now, literally with this kind of system, we can do that in, in 10 minutes. In 10 minutes, we can have an alert out, and in some cases faster than that, that says, hey, you know, this knitting machine upstream has this problem. And that's where you really get to see the yield improvements, right? And we'll have a slide on this in a minute, but as you're thinking about the, if you're, if you're internally working on pitching a deep learning project, um, I would say, you know, don't just think about uh, pass-fail classification, right? There's a bunch more business value to be had. Um, just to show you briefly, as far as kind of what this interface looks like for this customer, um, so here, you know, we're a Microsoft partner. We use Power BI kind of as our default uh, cloud visualizer for this kind of data. Um, we have other integrations we can do if you use Tableau or other systems. We do like Power BI. Um, so what we're just showing you here is just a couple screenshots of, of real-time dashboards that this customer now has. So these are updated as roles come in. Um, and this is pulling together data from multiple visual inspection systems across, you know, really multiple plants now. Um, and the MES data all together. Um, and you can do root cause analysis, kind of drill through, click down using these analytics dashboards um, really quickly. And this is available to anyone in the company who, you know, who needs this data. Um, so sharing this data, making it available, um, tying it to the visual inspection, this is where we see really the huge, you know, very large business, business impacts coming. Um, again, you know, the real-time decisioning is super valuable, um, but it's just, it's just part of the overall, overall puzzle. And just to underline that point real quick, um, here's just a few numbers that we pulled out from a couple different case studies. Um, and again, if you'd like to learn more, or we'd be happy to share more details, 
Um, but what this, these are just some numbers we've grabbed, like I said, from, from different case studies um, <clears throat> to kind of demonstrate that it's, it's more than just decisioning, right? So it's more than just saying pass fail. Um, so we already mentioned that 30x false reject reduction, you know, kind of the performance numbers. Um, but other, there's other areas where really, uh, you know, uh, precise, rapid, uh, on the edge of deep learning can provide a lot of value, especially when it's plugged into larger scale data. Um, so we kind of just mentioned the root cause analysis on the bottom. Um, so monitoring and alerting tied with root cause analysis is a, a really big area that we're, we're excited about. Um, we've already seen some big wins in that space. Um, and then just one other item that I'll point out briefly is there's other areas where having a, a, a good deep learning system can really make a difference. Um, another area is production line speed, for example. So some of our customers have actually had to slow down production to, to compensate for, for vision system issues. So for example, you know, if you have a dirty product, you have a flock on your product, you may have to slow down your production to remove that dirt. Um, that can, in some applications, that may no longer be a concern if you have a more flexible uh, vision system. So. Um, there's many paths to business value, and if you're in a position where you're thinking about putting together one of these projects internally, where you think deep learning could make um, <clears throat> could add some value, um, then we'd love to talk to you, and we encourage you to, to think about this from different angles. Because there, there's a bunch of, of things that change when you think about deep learning and apply it kind of on this enterprise scale. Um, and then finally, finally, I'll just end with you know how do we start out these projects? And I think this kind of fits into that overall kind of you know where do we see ourselves and where do we see the overall landscape for uh, you know kind of ai companies versus traditional machine vision companies what's in the middle how does all this work um for us you know another piece of the puzzle is how do we actually do these projects as you can imagine we've, we've, we've had some successes which is, which is great and we've seen some projects flounder you know a lot of times we, we make that happen as early as we can right if we, we don't think the customer is going to be able to to do their part um, but one way we do that is, is this process basically so we try to get really clear at the beginning about success um, you know, what do you really need? What's the performance? And we try to involve multiple stakeholders there. So um, we love talking to IT. We love talking to, to quality engineers. Um, but really, you need at least two sets of stakeholders there, we find, at the beginning to, to really have a successful project. Sometimes different groups talk different languages. And you need you really need both to be successful. Um, from there, we really start with a data set. So give us some images. We'll show you what we, what we can do, what, what our AI system can do. Um, if that is within your requirements and, and, and it makes sense about how all this will work together, um, then we go into basically proving it out through 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 a pilot. Um, so we take this iterative approach. You know, it's a new technology, so there are special concerns to take into account. Um, and different domains are different, kind of like Peter alluded to at the beginning. And um, as Peter alluded to at the beginning, um, the uh, manufacturing you just have a, a higher degree of variance than you would in other um, deep learning application areas. If you take like uh, consumer retail areas like that, um, it, it's much easier to drag and drop solutions. For manufacturing, you do see um, uh, things just look different, and there's different requirements of different customers. So I think I'm a smidge over time. We've got about 13 minutes for Q&A. So with that, I will, I will move to our last slide here. Um, you know, As we mentioned, please reach out to us. We love talking about these applications. We'd love to hear about yours. Here are both of our uh, emails. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Um, with that, I will stop, and I will turn it over to, I think, Dennis right for, uh, for Q&A. Yes, thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, we will now begin our Q&A. Just a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A icon on the bottom toolbar to do so. Let's go to our first question. What is an average defect detection rate when using deep learning in AI for inspection applications? Uh, yeah, great question. I, I can take that one. Um, so yeah, it really depends on the application. And with deep learning, what's really interesting is you can drive better performance with more labeled data, right? And we work with our customers. You know, generally customers are doing most of the labeling because they have the domain expertise. Um, I think a common misconception about deep learning is that um, you have kind of this super, you know, AI sentient one model that learns across all these domains, and it, it, the more data makes everything better. Um, and that's kind of true in some domains, but with manufacturing, we have typically found that um, it's better to have uh, models that are more customized to individual customers' problems. Um, so the performance you can achieve really has to do with how complex your problem is um, and how much data you're able to label consistently. Those are the, really the two big things. Um, and you can drive very high performance numbers. Um, but the, the performance you can achieve, it very much depends on application to application, and it very much depends on how much data you uh, you're able to label. And usually that's an iterative process. You know, through the POC, we'll kind of establish some baselines that we think we can be X percent accurate. Um, and then when you get into pre-production, you're collecting more data, you're iteratively making improvements to the model, and that really can you can you can push that process as you need to to improve performance. That that's a big difference between 
deep learning and traditional machine vision is deep learning you have this kind of built-in continuous improvement mechanism which is uh, really powerful it's not magic you know it takes time um, sometimes things go backwards you have to go back and reevaluate a little bit but um, you do have that mechanism built into the technology and uh, I'd, I'd like to add something if you don't mind it that is probably the second question we get asked <laughs> Right. Yeah, totally, and, and yeah. It's, it's totally fair. It, it's totally fair, and and sometimes I, I actually envy the traditional computer vision people. I envy the regular controls people because sure. deep learning is a probabilistic process. What happens, therefore, is that it's learned. It's trained by you. It's not trained by us, you know. And as a result, if in step one of our process, we go, well, what are you really trying to solve? And so someone might go, well, you know, I need to know what I need to know what it is. Otherwise, you know, why should I give you any of this money? And why should I spend my time with you, et cetera? And, right. and they just say, I want it to be 99%. And we go, well, well why? What are, you, what, what are you doing right now? Right, <laughs> you know? right. yeah. and, and, and sometimes you get the math out and, and people, that's why we involve multiple people. That's why it's a conversation because we have calculators and we can tell you your payback. So the, the it's the right, it's a it's a fair question, but I would say a better question is is for the amount of money it costs, how good does it need to be, right? Because that makes a, an incredible difference to your viewpoint and the sustainability of the solution, and more importantly, how often and how frequently and how reliably you're going to get a return on your investment. And right. That's what I wanted to add to. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Our next question, how can I take advantage of deep learning and AI applications in my foundry part casting process? Stephen, is that me or you? I think, you want, you want to take a crack at that one first? Yeah, why not? Okay. Um, Again, every time we talk to folks, it's going, well, have you ever done, you know, have you ever done, have you ever worked with people like us before? Have you ever done this? Have you ever done that? And uh, and the short answer it is, is uh, well, no, no, not really. No, we're, we're a young company. This is a technology that's young. Um, but here's a, here's that here's why we have to offer that one two three process, right? It's a new technology. People go, well, okay, I don't even know how it works. It seems all a bit kind of strange to me and and we we just have to do it we have to find a way of coming together finding we're not going to do the whole project but we're going to find a way of finding out okay that's why we got send us some images right tell us what you want to know from those images and then we'll run a very quick model through just to see if it's okay we have a we have a thorough readiness assessment process that we go through, which is that whole step one thing we were talking about. And the step two is this, it. So it's not as, as, have you ever worked with a foundry or have you ever been in my business or have you done that? Because I'm telling you, what we did for the other customers is not gonna apply to you, okay? And But what we can do is bring something that is repeatable, it's a product a process and share the images with you and we'll let you know. And, and for, it, it, and it doesn't matter whether we've seen it or not before. The things that we bring with us, the value that we add, has nothing to do with any particular set of information because we're learning from you. We're not bringing expertise with us. We're just bringing a machine that allows you to basically be a force multiplier for your own expertise. That, um, so we can't give out percentage for the reasons we said, but if you're serious, give us a call and you know, we understand the process and let's see how we go. Yep. Stephen, you got anything to add to that? No, I think that was that was excellent. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, I think people do get hung up on the different, you know, will it apply to this industry? Um, and, you know, we can't sit here and say, you know, deep learning is perfect for every industry, right? So we, we can't sit here and say that. We have seen that it's, it's significantly more flexible than you may think. Um, and just like Peter said, you know, what we bring to a domain, it's not, you know, you have the domain expertise, right? We we know how to, we know how deep learning works. We know how to train these models. We know, you know, we've invested a lot of time in our software that makes it easy to get these things deployed on your factory floor and they're going to be reliable, all that stuff, right? All that stuff that's exactly the same in, in you know, a foundry business as it would be in a, a fabric business. 
Um, and it, it was interesting, you know, when we first got into this space, we really didn't know, you know, my background's in autonomous driving and there, you know, really you can make kind of the supermodel, right? You could just pick an industry. You could say, I'm going to focus on road signs and because road signs, maybe road signs is a bad example, but I'm just going to focus on detecting cars, for example. Um, that's like general enough that, that you kind of can make one model across multiple areas. Um, in manufacturing, um, it's, it's, it, it, if, if we, we learned early on there's no there's no reason for us to sit down and try to make a deep learning model that's just for foundries. Um, it's much better to make a set of tools that can learn quickly from a small amount of data that can be labeled by each customer. Um, and so our, our tools are the ones that let you train the model to solve your problem, right? We're not in the business of solving you know all these different use cases. We, we end up doing it with our customers, but really they're doing the labeling. We're just providing the technology. So. Um, See, I'd say overall we're very bullish, but what we'd love to do, like I said, on that first call, we usually can pretty quickly tell you if we think that we can be successful in your industry. And looking at some images, talking about your business problem, that's generally how we do it. So, um, so yeah, we'd love to learn more. Um, and we, we, and just specifically in foundries, we have had some, you know, we have some things in flight in the foundry space, but there's just so many different things within the foundry that, that you could look at, right? So we would want to learn what you're looking for specifically uh, within your overall production. Our next question is also industry specific, but I think it's a different type of product than we've spoken about thus far. Uh, the question we'd like to know if deep learning has been used, or if you have any experience using deep learning with the monitoring shade or color variation in the production of textiles such as yarn. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I can take a fresh track of that. So yeah. Um, it's a good, we've, we've been, we've, we, we have run into that and we, um, in a few different cases. Um, so where deep learning is really going to apply really cleanly, um, and, and there's, it's a sliding spectrum, but you know, deep learning is going to apply most cleanly in the cases where you have inspectors, you have quality experts that say, I know it when I see it, I know this is X kind of defect, um, but it's going to be hard to write rules to capture that defect, just like the stain and the flock and the fabric. That's like deep learning bread and butter and those kind of applications we know we can be successful. When you're measuring color, um, the thing that changes is your sensor starts to matter a lot more. Um, I think generally with the introduction of deep learning, we're seeing a shift away from needing, you know, a really overbuilt sensor systems. Cameras are still critically important. You can't just point an iPhone <laughs> at your product. That's we're not there. Maybe one day, right? But that's that's not where we are in 2020. Uh, camera systems are very, very important. Um, and in color, that becomes more so the case. Um, so there's a typical camera system will have pretty severe limitations on its ability to make fine grain differentiations in color. Um, and the, uh, the uh, really in those cases, what we recommend to most of our customers is starting with the sensor. Um, in some cases, you, it may just be a matter of, of having a better sensor system um, and then not using deep learning. There's no direct obvious way that deep learning is gonna make a better color outcome. It doesn't mean it's not out there and we'd love to hear about your application, um, but it's not, it's not an easy, obvious mapping where, oh, there's this deep learning algorithm X that's going to be way better at doing color because color is so sensitive, dependent on the sensor. Um, and the, the litmus test we always use is, you know, if the color variation you're talking about or whatever variation you're talking about, if, if your expert can see it in an image, then we can usually pick it up, right? Um, but for color variations, we found that those are really tricky and you'd want to make sure first that your imaging system can pick up those color differences. Because um, a lot of times you'll be surprised that it, it can't in some cases and it'll be very sensitive to lighting. So um, the lighting really, really matters with color variation. So it's not an obvious application of deep learning. We wouldn't rule it out, but where we would look more at the sensors there first to, 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 to learn about the overall problem. And to be honest, it might not be a place for deep learning. We, we would just want to learn We'd want to learn more. Yeah, when we, when we put that Venn diagram together at the beginning, we were serious. Metrology, geometry, there's a whole bunch of other ways to do visual inspection and look at characteristics, and deep learning is not the way to get it done. Okay, it has strengths, it has weaknesses, just as the same as all technology has, and color is, is probably one of its weaknesses. Yeah, I agree. Uh, next question, how difficult is it to label images for use in deep learning training? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, Peter, I can take a quick hack at it, and then uh, we'll, we can pass it back and forth. Um, oh, labeling is, right. All right, cool. Uh, labeling is just, it's critical, as, as, as you've probably seen in our talk, and as you may know from other areas, you know, the model is only as good as the labels, right? Um, and if you look out there, actually, kind of in the deep learning space, the, the companies that are raising just tons of money right now are the labeling companies. So it's not like the companies who have some X new fancy 
um, you know, model. It's the ones who have really good labelers, labeling tools, you know, things like that. Um, we have seen that trend as well at Mariner, and we are investing in that ourselves as well. Um, so, you know, in, in full transparency, this is a, an, an evolving process at Mariner. Right now, we have um, a few different labeling options, and we, you know, in the past, we've worked with our customers where we have some in-house labelers at Mariner, and they have some labelers as well, and we'll kind of collaborate. Um, and we've, we're, we've started to build labeling functionality into our tools, even all the way at the production line, which we've, we've seen some really good traction with. So it's really cool if you're watching our system process in real time and we get something wrong or we need to be tweaked, you can adjust it right there. You can tag it right there. We found that to be really, really helpful. Um, and going into 2021 on our product roadmap, we are investing more in, in our labeling efforts because um, we know that I mean, right now it really is the biggest friction point. Now, the question was about how hard is it, right? And I think my answer was, you know, we're working really hard to make it easier. Um, today, you know, I, I'd say when you're working with a company like us, we're going to work with you very closely to make sure that you're not spending, you know, huge amounts of resources on labeling. We're going to find a way. There's a bunch of techniques you can do to make labeling simpler. One's called active learning. I'd be happy to talk about that on a call. Um, but um, but it's, it's a super important area. When you work with a company like us, we are going to remove that friction. Today, we remove it by a mix of manpower and technology, and we're improving our technology constantly to make it even less less friction because it is it's the long pole in the tent it's uh it just it's a it, your model's only as good as your labels uh, with that on behalf of vision systems design i would like to thank peter dara stephen welch and all of you for joining us today this presentation will be archived within 24 hours and can be accessed from the home page at visionsystems.com the slides and some additional resources will also be available for download today. You can access these slides and resources by using the resource icon on the bottom toolbar. A reminder email message for the archive will be sent to registrants complete with a direct link to the archive. If you have any questions about today's presentation, please feel free to email me at dsemeka at endeavorb2b.com. We thank you again for joining us today and look forward to providing with webcasts in the future. Bye.